ni telunera ni kumbili ni Okay, it's 4.05, so let's start with the meeting. Um, well, welcome to everybody who is connected here to this, um, to this lecture. Um, well, today we're going to talk about fundamentals of deep learning and well, the, the, the person who is invited uh, today is Mr. Joe Paulo Navarro. Um, he is a computer scientist um, with lots of uh, with lots of experience in well, in computer modeling and working in well, and he also has worked in in well, in the segment of energies uh, during well, most of his career. So well, I hope you feel well introduced <laughs> and. Well, you can start at this moment. I, I am uh, recording the meeting because, well, uh, the idea is to, to share uh, this meeting to the ones that, who, who can connect at this moment. So the floor is yours. Uh, you are muted. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, let's do it. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Right, and first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to, to have these conversations with you uh, and to talk a little bit about deep learning. It's one thing that I'm really excited to to have conversations and, and to discuss. I've been in the field for, for some time, quite some time, seven, six years. I'm working on, on practical projects. Um, applying deep learning to to solve real challenges, mostly in, in the seismic domain or in gas domain, right? For customers in Brazil. Um, so um, um, I'm João Paulo Navarro. I work for Nvidia for about five years, right? Before that, I worked for for a research institute here in Rio de Janeiro, uh, called Pucarillo, working for Petrobras uh, related projects, right? And since then, since this time, about nine years ago, I'm starting to get more engaged into this uh, oil and gas uh, related uh, software development. And it's quite a really uh, beautiful field to, to work for us that are computer scientists that work to combine, I like to combine um, science with um, kind of more traditional science, math, physics with, with uh, computation science in general. Right, and this fusion with deep learning and artificial intelligence is kind of uh, kind of a recent uh, area of investigation. Some, at least, get, getting a little more, little bit more traction into this uh, geophysics and and geology fields from the last five years, I would, I would say. Right, and now we're starting to see algorithms come into the production environment. From the Nvidia side, we work lots of. Um, um, is the escucha muy bajo? My, my, my audio is, is bad, Alejandro? Well, I can hear you very well. I don't know if, um, if, if just Juan Carlos has the problem or, or if everyone else has it. Um, I, I suggest to, to wear headphones and also it is possible to, uh, to, to allow the subtitles Okay. Um, in the meeting, so well, in order to to increase comprehension. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me share my screen with you. Start, stop talking about me. Um, so, um, what what's the plan for today, guys? So the plan for today is for us to to get um, kind of an introduction, an overview about this fascinating field, which is uh, deep learning, right? Um, the content that I'm, that I'm bringing to you today, it's part of, um, it's part of one broader course that we have at NVIDIA at the um, Deep Learning Institute. Deep Learning Institute is is basically, so sometimes, I'm, I don't know if you're seeing my, 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 my camera as well, so I have two screens here if I, looking a little bit uh, in these directions because my, my, my other screen is there. Um, but the plan here is, is this course is 
a more broad one broader one it has some practical exercises i can i i compacted everything into into um into a zip file and go to send to you uh the exercises that we are not going to have too much time to do this course is about to be delivered in about eight hours right we're going to do just pass through the slides and present the concepts of what we we uh, it's basically the most important that you need to know about deep learning at this moment where I'm, I'm trying to get until until the point that we are able to to discuss about convolutional neural networks which i believe it's really a hot topic for for everyone that's kind of uh working with with seismic right and geology and other stuff so just a quick second um i just need to to close some things here really sorry for that don't worry take your time Okay, okay. Okay. Okay, so let's start. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you as well also the, the slides that I'm probably not going to be able to cover, right? Just to you to have as a reference. And I'm going to pass as well <clears throat> another, uh, the link for the, the complete, the complete, um, um, workshop if you want to to try to make it online at the nvidia website it has a fee involved i don't know it's up to you if you want to to pay for this but just so you can use also have as as an option right um so the main goal of this, what we're going to talk today is so to try to bring you to the universe of uh, neural networks and 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 deep neural networks quick right with some some hands-on experience as I, as i told to you we're not going to have too much time to do the exercise here so we're going to pass the ball to you so we can just uh, <clears throat> set up an environment to run a jupyter notebook and then run on top of it uh with if you have a gpu it's better because it's going to run fast but it's not actually necessary um and because uh, this um, hands-on experience card is very interesting because it it kind of makes uh, our experience a little um, um, way more more um, uh, more practical practical and make us think a lot and and bring us uh, quickly to to the to the field right um, okay so let's move forward. So in the, the in this first part, I want to cover this in uh, 20 minutes. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a little bit of the introduction of deep learning. We are also going to and and how uh, the impact it's causing in 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 promoting in lots of different fields. Uh, we're trying to understand a little bit more with details how actually uh, a neural network trains, what means training, what means uh, intelligence in this field, because neural network is a, it's a, um, a super field in computer, computer science that is inside artificial intelligence right actually neural networks is a type of an algorithm that's under the machine learning umbrella as well so it's uh, it's going to be a little bit more clear in the second moment and we also going to talk about convolutional neural networks which is a different type of, of um, neural network that is being proved to to be an uh, extremely robust solution when you're working with uh, structured data, right? Uh, sorry, um, with uh, spatial, spatial data, right? For example, uh, images, videos, or, or, or uh, audio as well, right? Let's see if we can get time to talk about a little bit um, data augmentation and deploy. And I'm going to pass to you some other slides about pre-training models and other advanced architectures if you want to take a look in a second moment, right? OK, so let me just try to organize a little bit better my screen here. Um, here, OK.
Okay. So, um, it's interesting to say that artificial intelligence, uh, despite the fact that we are talking about too much of artificial intelligence these days, but this is a very old field inside the computer science, right? It dates um, since from, from the beginning of the computer science uh, existence itself. So it's kind of interesting because, because it's, um, it's a field. So what is artificial intelligence? It's basically a superfield into uh, computer science that targets that I means to to develop an algorithm that can reproduce their the uh, human intelligence. Right. The concept is quite pretty clear. The kind of the challenge, the difference from what we have today is that the type of algorithms that we 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 have nowadays are way more robust and solve way more complex problem that it was uh, started develop years ago. So we're talking about, uh, for example, at 50s, right? So uh, 1950, it's the year that we just uh, around that that we just started to that this term artificial intelligence was was introduced, right? So. Um, Uh, really, yeah. So ab about these topics that we have here in, um, in the um, in the screen. So the computers are made in part to, to complete human tasks, basically. And in the very beginning, it, it was thinking to to have kind of a, a generalized way to to propose uh, algorithms that could reproduce the entire uh, human brain system, which was kind. Uh, really hard to it turns to be really hard to achieve right and what actually we have today in the field of artificial intelligence is that we 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 have this kind of line of researchers these research areas that try to develop this kind of uh, skynet stuff right so a uh, really huge uh, algorithm that can do all different sort of tasks but this is kind of a, a area of research mostly what we have are kind of specialized algorithms that are developed to solve really particular and specific tasks right and one sort of algorithms that that fits in, into these this particular uh um, uh, framework that I just specified, which is algorithm that try to solve really, really particular um, algorithm, is the um, the neural networks, right? So the the neural networks are a type of algorithm that was uh, created, started to be developed under the 50s, right, and it was kind of expired by by biology. Right, so we try to model into into algorithm the way that our brain, that our neurons connect to each other. So we have the axion and we have the connections between uh, between the different ne neurons, and it kind of propagates through different other uh, neighboring neurons. And that was basically the the inspiration. But we're not going to see, and because we're going to see the math around this be behind this, actually, uh, we're going to see that uh, the way that we started to model it, it way more more simple that you can believe, right? So we're basically talking about um, uh, lots of, of uh, linear algebra involved algorithms, right? So we basically doing linear classifications, linear regressions, and and it's kind of really beautiful how this actually work today uh, in more complex environments. Such simple algorithms solving really hard problems, right? So, and let's talk about uh, actually uh, just a step behind how uh, the 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 more traditional algorithms work for a long, long time, right? The thing is that the way that we've been developed uh, um, algorithms inside, not only into that match the field of artificial intelligence, but let's talk about uh, artificial intelligence algorithms specifically, because I'm saying this because. Uh, all the other algorithms are kind are kind of uh, have have a similar partner uh, a, a pattern right which is um we to solve a particular problem we need to understand a lot about the problem itself right so but the thing is that when we try to solve a problem 
that it has too many variables. It's kind of really complex for us as humans to, to model all the stuff, right? So, um, for example, let's talk about a concrete example. So, uh, what are actually these three images that we're seeing here? So, we're seeing a lot of uh, different um, patterns that, that in, in this image. For example, suppose that you just want to do a classification algorithm that receive as an input one of these images and the output is kind of a flag, kind of um, a label that, that tells you um, what are actually th this thing are being represented. For example, here we have a, a we can be labeled as a notion or as uh, a wave, right? In the second image, you can have a kitty, a cat, in this third one, um, a car, right? And what are um, our original algorithm in, into this um, this area, which we call we call expert systems, would try to do, right? So, for example, to get to to get to get to the the cat problem, what 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 how an algorithm would be uh, to solve this problem? So basically, we would try to understand what are the shapes of this of this um, of this cat. So we basically can get this image pass a filter, right? This filter is going to, for example, to extract borders from the from the model, right, from the image, and then we can start to see some sort of geometry, and then we can try to to match this geometry with a geometry that you believe that's uh, kind of uh, really close to a cat, right? And, and then we can have a solution for the algorithm. But notice the problem is, uh, and when we talk about here, uh, this highly complexity is based because our algorithm is extremely dependent on the input that we have, right? And if, if we have different conditions from, we ha if we have different conditions from the algorithm, for example, suppose that we have this cat, but now uh, behind this car, and we have just you know a near or or its tail right and we want to actually identify and detect that there is also that there is a cat there right so it's kind of a problem because most of your algorithm would identify a car right and how could we detect a cat on this image so combining all these situations is kind of really complex because you need to program rules to identify all these scenarios but it's kind of impossible right and in this presentation i don't have but, but there are other presentations that I have other examples that I find really fun because, for example, uh, we have lots of, uh, in this other presentation, I have, for example, dogs wearing kind of Halloween costumes, right? And, well, they're really in, in the type of the way the dogs are represented in these images like, are can really go crazy, right? In terms of the because the dogs are kind of wearing costumes that are in different colors from the, the original colors of the dog, of course, because it's kind of costume. Uh, for example, blue, but we do not have blue dogs. So, if you use colors, for example, your algorithm will never get that you're talking about a dog in this image. This type type of image, really specific one, kind of way complex. Of course, I know that, but just to show you that it's kind of outstandingly uh difficult to 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 tackle these ones right and what are the approaches that we 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 trying to model so what we starting to see is uh coming back to how the humans actually uh learn right the process of learning in the, uh, of a child for example if you, you are training or you uh teaching a a child to identify what is a cat or not. So how, how are you going to, how, how the brain works, right? What you basically do, you provide the child examples of this object, of this animal, of what whatever you're trying to, uh, to teach to this child, right? For example, uh, you're going to see a cat on the street and you're going to grab your child, your kid, and go to show. So this is a cat. And you're teaching him by an example, just showing what is a cat. And when it, when the child just go to the TV, for instance, and start to see a cat, which is different from the reality, because it's kind of a draw, right? It's an animation. And, and you told the cat, so this is a cat as well, right? And when you have a table, for example, and 
your kitty is just walking around and passing behind the, this table and you just you can say as well so behind this table there's a cat you're just seeing the tails just seeing the, the ears of this cat right and with lots lots um so um with the time which is uh going to happen is that this kid this 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 child is going to learn based on these examples what are the 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 main characteristics that classifies that actually describe what is a cat which is what what, what is actually a cat right so what when we're talking about this field of machine learning right and let's let's talk about machine learning right so we're talking about artificial intelligence a class of algorithms that try to um implement things um, actually methods that can mimic the the how we actually think or right and inside the superfield of artificial intelligence we have machine learning and machine learning is actually what we're talking about here it's what most of these algorithms are are uh, or um use it as a reference that's right so we starting to look at the data not try to solve the rules and exactly rules that describe a problem right and notice that for example when you're teaching a child so you're not telling the child that okay look at this image that you're just seeing to the reality and try to identify the patterns of you know the triangular boundaries of the ears of the animal if it's triangular it's probably going to be or a dog or a cat it's not going to be i don't know a lion right so you, you do not expose the patterns ex explicitly what you just do you just show examples right and this is about machine learning this is how all the machine learning algorithms work so you present the data you let the algorithm eat all of this data and kind of automatically identify the patterns right and this is actually the intelligence of the algorithm so the machine learning algorithms are basically optimization algorithms that uh, receive this input data operates an algorithm that learns some parameters right so we, we have these learnable parameters inside these networks or or this machine learning model better saying and and then you can apply in a second moment this algorithm to and and then you do a lots and lots of iterations so we present um a chunk of data and a chunk of answers for the, this data for the most common problems in machine learning which you, we call the supervised learning type of algorithm so we have an x you don't have a y and the this, the algorithm itself just look to this data right and try to infer automatically what are the patterns that actually made this mapping of x and y's right okay so and there are some very interesting things regarding the 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 deep learning revolution so we just saw that artificial intelligence is an old field neural networks kind of started it just born uh, way, way long ago. But what is the moment? But why just now this type of algorithm st showing, uh, starting to showing its all of its values, right? It's a very good question, right? So we are uh, today, um, in in the last ten days, basically, kind of in a perfect storm to develop this type of algorithms because we're talking about data, right? So we just learn it that the machine learning algorithm and the deep learning algorithm which is a class of algorithm that are inside machine learning uses data to learn the patterns right we do not implement if analysis of each one of the objects that for example talking about classification of prob a classification problem that we want to want to match right we present data let the algorithm learns automatically what are the patterns that describe this data that can actually map to a, to a solution right and the neural networks so the deep neural networks or deep learning right deep neural networks and deep learning are kind of uh uh kind of the same same thing when i'm talking about this right for you that are not really familiar uh it's a kind of algorithm that needs lots of data to actually learn these mappings right so this is kind of crucial to understand deep learning right because when i'm talking about the perfect storm we're talking about uh 
that we didn't have too much data availability in the past, right? For this reason, we didn't have in the past uh, these algorithms working so well, right? And this is kind of a very uh, particular characteristics of the deep learning algorithms that it actually needs these lots of data, right? To, to make it work properly. It's like, for example, suppose that you have a child and your child just saw in their life uh, one one dog for example right and just grow up just saw sawing for example it grow in a farm and leave it there for all his life and until we get into a little bit more more old and okay so even if he didn't have access to all the things so if he just saw a picture of a dog right a different dog that the ones that he was used to it may be not very uh, familiar and very confident to, to affirm, to assure that that new thing that he just saw when he just got old and he just moved to a town, that this is actually a dog, right? So what you need to do is to present during this learning phase a lot of different examples in different positions, different geometries until the brain just uh, starting to match automatically the patterns that describe a dog and despite what are the way that this kind of thing are going to be showing to you in the future you're going to do this actually this matching right and 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 kind of use this this pattern automatically and saying that the thing that you're just seeing and in the, in an image in in a, in a personal it's a dog or not for example a fox right understand the difference because i'm not talking about different dogs i'm talking about what's the difference between a dog and a fox because in our lives we saw lots of different examples of all of these animals in in way 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 uh and lots of lot, lots of, of of different manners we know what's the difference between a dog and a fox right and and this is the fundamentals of deep learning we need to have these lots of different data so the algorithm can adjust its weights Right, so it's a term, it's parameters um, that can act, act actually uh, uh, that can actually uh, give you the correct answer no matter what is the input. Right, so this is one thing interesting that we call uh, in in the, in the field that is generalization. So generalization is uh, a very important property of of um, inside machine learning field, which is the ability of your model to to give you a correct answer for a non-seen example. Right, so your your algorithm is good enough to to tell you a correct answer for things that he didn't saw in the past. Right. So since we're talking about uh, a lot of data, for example, when you're talking about training a machine learning algorithm, a deep learning algorithm, we're talking about to have millions of images, right? And so images with good quality. So each image, when we re represent it in computers, we basically use matrices as, as a basic representation for it, right? And... Um, with three, ch three channels. So we use three integers to represent each pixel color that we have, each pixel that we have in each image that's going, these three integers are going to generate uh, um, uh, uh, a color for us in the in the real world domain, right? Uh, and the thing is that when we, we have images in high quality or in high amount, we need to do a lot of processing to train this algorithm. And this is where the, the, the GPU right just came to the field right because the gpu it's a type of processor right so a gpu a different um, um graphics process unit it's a device that has thousands of cores in 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 contrast with cpus right when you're talking about cpus we have you know dozens of cores we have uh nowadays we we may have hundreds of cores into a into into a, a server right a very good server but we can't reach thousands of cores into a single server today with cpus and this is where uh the gpu excels because gpu is a parallel processing uh device that has thousands of cores that can be used to do this parallel processing really really fast when we're talking about deep learning right 
Okay, so we we already discussed a little bit about uh, the fundamentals of the of the of the deep learning, and the one really one thing that's important to, to you to tackle from to get from from all of this conversation, at it actually <clears throat> modifies the traditional way, these expert ways to to do um, to solve problems, right? So when you're talking about, remember the the classification algorithm for cats or for dogs, for example. Uh, so if you're doing it in a traditional way, you just have to define a set of rules to classification. Remember, for example, oh, okay, let me try to get my cat or my dog, let's talk about dogs, uh, to, to get my dog um, in front of the images so I know where's the boundaries of the dog, let's try to find the geometry and if analysis and if analysis, you try to you define manually these rules, all these rules and for example color. So if um, the main object in the scene is blue or green, it's not a dog or I don't know, a very different type of dogs that we do not have in this world, so we're not going to map this one, right? So. It's possible as well, but notice that the thing, the main key uh, takeaway in this one is that you need to program all manually all these rules, right? And then we just feed data, right? And the algorithms kind of output the results, basically. So the, all the effort is to actually program the patterns that you, you, you want to match, you want to identify, right? And when you talking about machine learning, we do kind of an opposite way. We do not try to identify beforehand the characteristics of a dog. What you do is prepare a huge data set and use this data set, feed the model that you're training with this data set and let the model just learn what are the 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 um, the, the the patterns that matters, right? The patterns that are actually uh, necessary to do a good classification, right? Okay, so in the model learns to correct uh, categorize as it's training. It's interesting because, uh, and here we have two moments during your algorithm development, your machine learning model development, which is we have this phase, in this training phase, you have a model that actually just do not know anything about what he's going to learn, right? And as he's starting to see examples, examples, example, he's starting to adjust his weight and get to a better model that can actually deliver uh, um, a good result, right? And after you just finish this training phase, which is have your data set, present all your data set to the model, to this optimization algorithm, this machine learning algorithm, and then it going to it's going to uh, to deliver you a result, right? So the thing is here, the key takeaway in machine learning, the algorithm that you're using are actually the one responsible to automatically match, to automatically learn what are the patterns that most important in the image, right? And notice that this is kind of a really, really fundamental shift, right? So, um, and this is also important. So deep learning is suitable for all the problems that we have in the world. It's kind of a really, really good question because an answer is no, right? So, but you're saying that deep learning is kind of really powerful to solve a lot of different problems. Yeah, it's true. But the thing is that we have sometimes kind of um, not that complex type of problems that need to use all of these things to 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 solve, right? So when when you when to decide when to choose deep learning. So uh, basically, if you have rules that are kind of clear, really clear and straightforward, so you can actually describe uh, with a really high percentage of 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 accuracy the result. Just go there, program program your if your your rules, your if analysis, right? So if you have these really complex environments, like working with images, working with videos, working with audios, strings, uh, maybe it's kind of a little bit different, right? Because for example, talking about uh, audio strings, if you're talking about, uh, it's kind of really complex environments that you can have. For example, if you have noise, you have a high chance to not have an algorithm that work perfectly, 
right? If you have, you know, background noise, I mean. So and this is important. So algor deep learning algorithms are kind of really specific to problems that are kind of really difficult to solve, right? And when you compare uh, deep learning to, to other AI algorithm, um, it's, it's um, interesting because what are these other AI algorithms? It's, it's important to, to map here. Um, so AI, it's a broader field, right? You have machine learning to this field. I'm going to repeat this just to, so, so you can actually get used to, to, to this more and more. But, uh, but notice that you have, for example, other searching algorithms, other algorithms that, for example, can, can, can play games that are not too complex, right? Chess is one type of game that are kind of complex, but are actually can be solved by by uh, direct methods, by expert methods, implement if analysis, right? But so there are different type of algorithms of in the universe of AI that can be used to solve these problems, right? And but now talking about machine learning itself. So inside the area of machine learning, we have neural networks and deep neural networks, which is kind of particular type of neural networks, which has some lots of layers. We're going to see this in a moment. And we have other machine learning algorithms like um, unsupervised learning algorithm like k-means. Uh, we have, for example, linear regressions. We have um, Bayesian searches. We have, uh, for example, three Bayesian algorithms, right? And all of these algorithms has kind of a particular. Uh, it, it has kind of a subset of fields that it kind of solve better the problem, right? For example, if you're talking about un unstructured data, so unstructured data are the ones like images and and uh, and videos, right? When you're talking about this type of algorithm, we know that deep learning solves it pretty well. So this is type of algorithm that you can actually use deep learning directly. Otherwise, you can go for this, these tree searching algorithms, right? Like XGBU, like GBM, and, and this type of methods, right? Uh, and the interesting part about deep learning itself, it's that, okay, so we, interesting question. Regarding the comparing the, the other machine learning algorithms with deep learning, what are the key differences? What the key differences, what, what I actually need to understand is that basically it's, uh, you can take to the data, right? If you have unstructured data, if you have text, if you have images, if you have videos, and if you have outer strings, right? It's probably that you going to be solved well using uh, deep learning, right? If you have tabular data, the ones that you can, for example, put in a CSV uh, a spreadsheet, right? You have columns and rows, right? And swapping rows and swapping columns kind of the opposite, right? Columns and columns and rows, you it do not change the, the characteristics of your algorithm, right? So it's most it's probably that you it's better to use other type of algorithms, uh, other machine learning algorithms algorithms to solve the problem. And the thing is that the deep learning you can increase the complexity of the algorithm on demand. If your problem is really, really complex, you can add, for example, more layers of processing. Right, we're going to see this in the next uh, slide set. Uh, and okay, so and to learn all these different and complex patterns that we can have, you we 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 can operate in up to billions. And nowadays, we're working in trillions of parameters, right? And we can have many many layers inside this network, right? And this is the fact that actually. Uh, gives this the deep uh, meaning to, to, to deep learning, right? The deep neural networks, right? Which is the number of processing layers that you have inside your algorithm to solve the problem. Okay, so just really quick, it's not too much important, but so, so uh, for us to, to understand what type of problems we, we, we're talking about that deep learning is solving pretty well. So computer vision, so computer vision is kind of a key field inside all of the most modern things that we are exploring as a society today. For example, robotics, uh, when we're talking about 
self-driving driving cars, uh, it all passes through this imaging algorithm. So classifying a dog and a cat with a really, really high percentage has had a really impact in future, in our future, right? For example, remember five years ago, Five years ago, we did not have a cell phone that was able to do this unlocking just to, uh, looking at your face, right? It's true because we didn't have deep learning algorithm or computer vision algorithm uh, robust enough that actually was able to match uh, our faces correctly, perfectly, right? And it's important to say that the type of algorithm that we're talking about, uh, I hope to get at least uh, just some touch into the convolutional neural networks. That is, um, the bases are kind of the same, right? For computer vision algorithm, the bases are the same. We're talking about the same way of doing optimizations. We just need to have different data sets, right? Different uh, loss functions and different objective functions, right? And then the middle part of the algorithm, the, the way that the algorithm operates is kind of the same when you apply this, for example, to robotics, to self-driving driving cars. And why self-driving driving cars and robotics are in the computer vision section? Because uh, what is the vision of the robot? It's a camera, right? And what is the vision of a self-driving driving car? It's also cameras and radars, 3D radars, LIDARs, right? So, and we use the same type of deep learning algorithms to solve the problems that are actually are going to be the engines for 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 this type of things, right? Um, natural language processing, another very complex field. So, uh, um, how we are applying this today for what type of uh, tasks? Real-time translation. We're seeing the, for example, the Google Translate. If you're using the Google Translate, how well it do are it is doing its uh, translation nowadays? Pretty good, right? Voice recognition. So we are using today our phones to speak something, so it can search for us automatically. Virtual assistant, not that good yet, but we're going going to get there, right? So this is just um, some sort of different. Um, different type of fields that deep learning excels. Recommender systems. So recommender system, for example, when you're using Spotify and you just receive um, a recommendation of a new playlist or for a new artist song that just about was just released and it kind of matched perfectly what you, your taste, right? It's kind of a, a recommender system. When they are walking on Instagram, for example, and it appears kind of a, a type of a product that you actually have a fit with you that we actually can like, this is a sort of um, artificial intelligence, not artificial intelligence, this deep learning algorithm running in the background, showing to you this, sometimes accurate recommendations, right? Um, and gamings, for example, using reinforcement learning, we are seeing a lot, lots of different type of robots that are doing pretty well uh, into some different tasks, right? Like playing video games really well these days. It's kind of a combination of an, an older, another, another artificial intelligent field called reinforcement learning field that also use deep learning inside, right? Okay, guys, so let me jump to the second slide set. Just a second. Okay, so let's try to get a little bit deeper inside um, the, the way that we actually, how, how the basics of, of uh, the neural networks itself, right? Okay, so I'm going to, to do a quick pause right now, just to ask if anyone here in the audience has a question. I do. Uh, well, uh, one question that I have is, well, you were talking about um, um, you were, that you can add a um, uh, bigger, bigger and more layers uh, in order to solve um, harder problems. So, well, I am, well, my question uh, directs to do complex rules means having uh, lots of parameters? Uh, no, not exactly. Complex rules, I mean, is you have lots of different conditions, right? For example, for a classification problem, you need first to identify if the object that we're seeing is a, a color that is different from, for example, a dog palette, right? So if it's uh, blue, it's not a dog. 
if it's green, it's not a dog, right? You can see. So this is just one rule. And then you append another rule. Okay, so if it is in the ocean, it is not a dog, right? Okay, so it passes from one rule from the other rule. Now we're going to plug different rules and another rule and another rule. You know, a lot of different if and else's. It's not related necessary to parameters. Parameters is more in the context of, of uh, machine learning models. Okay, so parameters are the mathematical um, values that we are using in our model. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so, we're going to see this right now. Okay, so each, well, if I'm understanding well, each rule is like, well, uh, a, a different layer. Um, we're not talking, um, so um, let me get back. So when you're talking about rules, we are talking about expert systems. We're not talking about machine learning, deep learning. Right, it's type of ordinary algorithms that are also used to solve this type of tasks, but show it that could not do a in a satisfactory way, right? So when we're talking about rules, we're talking about expert systems. We're talking about deterministic algorithms. Deep learning are non-deterministic stochastic type of algorithms, right? That do not have particular rules implemented manually it kind of learns from the data the patterns that it needs to know okay okay now now it's clear thank you right okay any other question well i think that you can continue okay Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, how actually uh, how to connect the dots regarding the training of a deep neural um, a deep neural network, right? Okay. Okay, so when you're talking about deep learning, we're talking about uh, training procedures, right? Uh, so um, when, when you're talking about, um, I'm, I told you that, so how, what you're going to try to, to understand, so please notice that this is not, for you to to stick with the whole details right that that we have here because it's probably going to be too much for you to capture right now in this small amount of time that we have but just try to capture the whole idea right i think that for now it's more important and when i pass to you the the exercises you're going to have some time just to practice and just to put your hands just to to try to 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 understand with more details some of this this um these features and this this uh, this thing that I'm talking about right now, right? So when you're talking about about um, data, so uh, what what actually uh, happens behind uh, a deep learning training procedure, right? Uh, better let let me just move forward to see if if I have. Okay. Now now we, we we can have more thing things a little bit more concrete. So let's let's try to do um, kind of a training of an algorithm, right? Of a deep learning algorithm, or not a, a deep learn right now. So let, let let let's try to 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 how we can actually uh, completional organize things. So when you, when you're talking about and using as an examples uh, an image classification problem, pretty well defined in literature, which is the MNIST problem. The MNIST is a handwritten data set that is lots of uh it's um been used for a long time to it's been used for a long time to implement these basic algorithms right and so here in, in the left left hand side we have uh, an example of this 
this uh, of, a, of a sample of that we have in this data set, right? And when you, okay, so we have this image and how we can actually represent this image. One way to represent the image is kind of in a linearized way. So we have 28 pixels, vertical, 28 pixels in horizontal, and we organize it, it's sequential, right? It, we organize it sequentially into a vector, right? So this is going to be our our input, right? And and how about the 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 outputs, right? For example, if you want to to, to implement an algorithm that can automatically identify and classify this uh, this image as a five, right? We need to have, for example. What are your, your output? How can I represent my output? One possible way for, for, for sure is to, is to have the categories like, for example, you have uh, just a single number, right? But this is uh, actually what we don't know, right? We not, not don't know, what we don't do. What we basically do, we use output to represent what we call um, one hot encoding representation, right? Our output is basically uh, an information of, for example, we have this M, the the MNIST data set, which is to recognize rent-written digit digits, right? So, uh, and we have ten digits from zero to nine, right? And what we do is basically whenever we have a, f a five. Right, what we're going to have, it's a one plug it into the the fifth position, right? So why are you doing this, John Paulo? So this is a good question. And the better answer that I can have right now is that, so our algorithm is not going to be perfect. It's not going to give you the correct answer, exactly the correct answer. So it's usual for us to have a probability output right so for example if it's the summation of all these numbers should be one right so if you have a one we have a hundred percent of sure that a uh, hundred percent sure that this is for zero a character zero right and okay so this is just talking about the output and let's move forward right and in um in a neural network algorithm, let's use this image to explain the procedure of training a model, right? When you were talking about training a model, we are talking about of having a model architecture, right? Which is basically a way to structure and to, trans to transform your input information, right? To generate as an output, a vector that has the high, has uh, in one of these uh, kind of neurons, output neurons, has a higher number up up to one that has a higher probability to have to be actually the number that we we are representing, right? So when when you're talking about a deep learning um, machine learning and also deep learning, let's uh, stick with deep learning in particular. You have now your input and we have these all these parameters inside our model that we do not know and the interesting part is that we can represent all these numbers all these parameters that we have inside the model as matrices right you're going to see this in a, se in a second and what we actually want to learn is what are the values that need to be inside one inside each of these parameters so uh in a second moment when we are not more in a training procedure we can just pass this information such a such an input to to the network and it delivers to me the better output right so this is how the magic um actually works on on, on deep learning this is in a more broader view so let's let's start with a more simpler model right so suppose that we have uh, you 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 want to just to to work it with uh, uh, a linear regression algorithm. So basically, you have 
uh, these two points, right? And the problem that you want to solve is what is the straight line that better represent this, this uh, that pass through all these points, right? Of course, you have two points. You can actually have um, uh, you can actually have one straight line that cross this both two points, right? But what what you have as an input is the x's and y's. So you have pairs, and you want to learn the coefficient m right, and B, right? And there are ways to solve these problems. We have kind of a um, direct method to, to solve this one, but the objective here is just to explore what are the potentials, right? So basically what you want to, to learn to discover automatically is what are the M's and the B's that better uh, fits this model, right? When are we going to have more dots here you can what we basically want to find it what is the trend for these points what is the best trend in a sense that we have a straight line that the distance between the points and the line is minimal right this is basically what we want to do okay so and one 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 way to do this is basically and how about if you just start randomly, just give random numbers to M and B, right? And understand how good is the solution for the problem, right? So for this problem, for uh, um, linear regression, what you we need basically to have also, which is kind of really important, a metric to decide if the model that we have found, right, is good or not, right? And, and notice that for this particular and very simple model, what we actually want to learn is these co coefficients, M and B, right? Let me get back a little bit just so, so we can, can, so I can explain a little bit be better for you the concept of an untrained model, right? So how a deep learning algorithm, I think that we need to better to stick in the basics because we do not have too much time. I'm really sorry for that. I shouldn't simplify a little bit more things here in this presentation. But um, so what we actually want to solve is we have an input, which is a vector, right? And we want that a mathematical procedure that is represented here by these layers process this input and give as an output a vector in this standard, meaning that if we have one in this really very first position here, it is 100% sure to be a zero character, right? If you have one in the second position, it have 100% sure in this, that, that this is a one, the number one classified, right? And of course, as I, as I said, we're not going to talking about, uh, we're talking about probabilities. We probably, the output of our network is not going to be uh, one here, is going to be, for example, 0 0.8, which represent 80% of chance to be a one, right? So when you're training an algorithm or a deep learning algorithm, you need inputs. So remember the cat story, the, the dog story, we need lots of cats and dogs. So in this case, we need lots of handwritten digits as an input. And what we want, and and what we want is the algorithm that learn parameters here inside the network. That actually, if we pass this five right represented as a as a, a vector, we have an output that going to have um, that going to have a one or a really high number up to one in the sixth position, right? Because we're starting with in zero, right? And and, and the, in the, during the training, what we usually do in a class of algorithm, um, deep learning algorithm that we call supervised learning is how I actually find these parameters, right? So we do not know exactly how these transformations are going to, to, to occur inside here, but we know that uh, we have numbers that need to be uh, learned that actually are going to receive this input, do some multiplications, and then output the result, which is this output vector here, right? And what we basically do in the supervised learning framework is 
we need to provide a training data set. So this is key. A training data set is a data set composed by access, the inputs and its representation and Ys, right? And these Ys, we have actually the truth. Right. So this is a very key concept inside deep learning, which is you need to provide your training data set with uh, inputs and the expected outputs or labels. Right. These labels is it's interesting. It, this is kind of interesting because when you're talking about uh, this type of things, we're meaning that, for example, if you want to, if you need to have millions of images of uh, uh, handwritten digits, you're going to have millions of outputs here? And the answer is yes, right? So when you're training an algorithm, you need to, some most of the times, to manually annotate, label your outputs, right? So it's, this is kind of really, really hard task, right? And, and how people in, around the world solve problems like, image classification in the past. So they use it, main power, they use it, thousands of peoples around the globe to helping developing a huge data set with inputs and outputs, right? This is going to be your, your training data set for your algorithm. So, so time ago, when you solved the problem of image classification, we basically uh, uh, had this million size data set to train the model right so this is really powerful right and really complex at the same time because so how crazy is to think that we have you need to have millions of images note and uh, noted and think better when you're just working in a real life project you actually need sometimes to do this annotation mentally right you need to do a data set uh um fine-tuning a data set that you actually, you know, know exactly that there are not wrong values there and everything is kind of perfect. So you have X's and Y's uh, matching perfectly, right? Okay, so we know the characteristics of the char characteristics of output. We know that I'm going to give you an input and I'm going to process, I don't know exactly how yet, they're going to do this inside this guy, right? But, uh, what we need to know here is that we have some weights here. We have some parameters that need to be learned. And what I'm showing, when, when, when I'm showing this really um, simple approach here is that we want to find a straight line. We do not have it. What you're going to do first, let's go into guess. Let's just start in a random point. Minus one and five, minus one for M, five for B. And this is the straight line that we get. How good is it, right? So to know how good is it, I need to have a metric, right? So one of one metric that really use it for some um, uh, regression problems, right? Is is uh, the the mean square error. So we're going to get the difference between the the x and the correct value that we're expecting, right? Subtract elevate to the square and I'm going to have a value right as um in summation over all of the samples so what you're basically doing here is to computing the distance between the straight line right and the point sum up everything and you're going to have a value so when we um, um and this is how we can actually um do this um oh, a second no okay Going to show here the, the loss, right? But the interesting part is that, okay, so now we move forward, we have a metric that can actually compute to me this distance, right? And how I can actually use this, this metric, right? If you just, and when one important concept inside deep learning is what we call the loss, right? So the loss is the objective function that we are trying to, to to minimize in some cases. So if you're using, for example, the MSA as our objective, objective function, what we actually want uh, ideally to have, right? We ideally want to have is a straight line that the distance between the dots and the straight line, so passing in this direction is zero, 
right? So our objective of optimization is to get a zero value of error, right? And when in optimization, we usually use the term um, um, objective function. In deep learning, we usually talk about uh, the loss function, which is basically the same. So we have a function in this case, for example, MSC, uh, mean square, that actually going to receive the value of what are the values that your network produced and what are actually the values that you are expecting, right? Computes the difference and then propagates a difference, right? And when you propagate this difference, you use this, how big, how far is your result from the expected one? You're going to use the gradient of these guys, right? another keyword. I'm going to use the gradient to actually learn the direction that we need to move towards the the towards the 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 zero, right? So, for example, suppose here that we are there in that example, simple example. So we have a random M, we have a random B, we have the inputs, and we have our current straight line, right? What we are seeing here in the right right hand side is um, the loss curve plot. So this is our searching space. So when you just plotting the errors in two direction, two two dimensions here using B plotting B and M, what we have here, what we have is okay. So uh, the current point that we have, right? So we are taking. Um, this m and computing the difference is going to give me this value right so for b around here b5 right and minus one here right is going is giving me the point in this direction what we want to find is the best b's and m's that actually produce the zero error right so the algorithm iteratively are going to do what? It is going to basically trying to adjust M and B in a sense that we are going to move the straight lines here, right, to a new point. Right now, my M is exactly minus one, my B is four, right? And when you compute the difference, so the difference, basically the distance here, we know that these type of value is a, little, is a little bit better, right? It's slightly better. And what we're going to do is we're going to iteratively changing the parameters M and B until we iterate and get to the target, right? So inside the deep learning, of course, guys, um, um, here, so you can actually understand this with uh, all the details of how actually how a deep learning algorithm operates in the background, right? Uh, we, of course, you're going to have more details. I'm simplify. We, we are simplifying here um, a lot our model, so you can have you can have the intuition around how the optimization problem works, right? So you have a point you want to get to another point and in this mean term you need to do these optimizations right um so in the algorithm that are actually used to to are actually used to decide what is the direction that i want to move because of course i can do this randomly for the rest of my life right so but think it's probably going to be hard to get to the to the real answer right it's probably going to be really hard right and what we basically do is that we actually what what is based on this value here what is there there is is good okay so we are moving in the correct direction there is bad we need to go to an opposite direction but please notice that it is not really clear right now how we can actually choose the direction to go right and yeah so let, let's introduce some 
let's introduce some terms, right? Some terms here that are kind of useful for us to, to understand a little bit more about the concepts. And all these this parameters that these concepts that we hear in the left high left le, um on the left side are the ones that you're going to see inside lots of uh, framework, uh, deep learning frameworks, right? So the gradient, the gradient is the less effort direction, right? Is actually the direction that the loss function, the objective function, remember there, kind of decrease most, right? So we are basically need to point to a direction here so what is the di direction that points to this guy? Probably this one, this straight line, right? And going iteratively to them, right? It's the algorithm is not smart enough to, to actually get to the real solution in a single step, right? It's way more compli com complex than this. But let's start to, to stay in this, in this uh, intuitive, um, try to understand more intuitively so we're going to probably going to find a direction um and the direction this vector this gradient of course it can be big it can be small and how big is it can be right for this uh we 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 use a term that is called the learning hate that actually controls how big is going to be our step towards the objective right it's calling the learning hate um an epoch is when we are using the data set to training of course you're using the data set to train the model right to find this actually this difference for example here here uh what are our data set is the dots right is the x's and y's we are using this data set we presented this data set to to actually uh approximate the, the 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 best solution right so um during a training procedure when you're talking about an epoch we are talking about when your algorithm use the whole data set to perform the optimization and we're going to do this for lots and lots of times right uh we are going to travel towards this direction and not in a single step right what we are going to do we're going to do this in steps, right? So when your data set is too big and you cannot just find, you know, um, when your data set is too big, what you're going to do most of the times is to divide your data set into minor parts, right? Which is called a batch, right? And a batch, it's a small part of your data set. So you have your full data set, you just get a batch of your data set. Just this small part. Use this small part to understand how good is the current parameter to what you expect, right? Compute the difference. This difference is give you a gradient update direction that's going to give you a better value of m right now if you're doing this interactively you receive the data set here just this batch part we're going to this m this new m and m and now we get a new data set in another step of the algorithm not a new data set a new batch and this batch is going to how good is this your current parameters regarding the inputs that we have and the target that you know right compute the difference find the gradient point to the gradient update your m and b boom you're here okay get your new part of your data set get a new batch a new small portion portion of it of your entire data set now you just you're we're here right now okay get your this batch pass this batch throughout your network compute the result compute the difference between the result and the target, the, the, the actually the correct values and understand the difference. If the difference is too big, what you're doing again, you just compute the error, find a gradient, point to the direction that gives you towards the less, the less, uh, the lowest values, right? And you're going to do this interactively until you reach your lowest error value.
right? So the algorithm basically do this in an iterative way, right? So guys, there's lots of concepts around here. Don't worry if you didn't understood. I, I'm going to pass you some extra materials so you can learn this more in depth. Some of the materials and some of, of the courses that I'm going to pass to you are free. Others are, um, there is a very good one in Coursera that give you uh, lots of information, good information um, about how this actually work. We have here in these slides as well, some math so we can do, so we can understand how the algorithm actually operates step by step. What are the math that you have behind this that, that you can actually provide uh, the gradients as I'm saying here, right? So we're not going to get into, into this, this very low details but the thing is that you're going to need an algorithm that actually computes to you this gradient right so the key takeaway from this explanation is how a neural network train you receive a value a batch of samples you compute the value of the samples that pass it through this network and you know an error, right? These errors are going to give you a gradient that are going to be key to identify and change the weights, right? When you know this gradient, you are now able to change your Bs and your Ms so until you can get here, right? And the algorithms um, that actually operates the, all the math that we have around this, behind this actually, is what we call the optimizers. And here, just the names of some optimizers, optimizers, the most important one for you to learn, to actually learn, to understand how it works, is the SGD, which is the Stochastic Gradient Descent, right? It's a pretty common algorithm in deep learning. Most, today, most of this, mo most of the, um, uh, we have more sophisticated ones, which is these guys here. So it's a little bit more complex, but not that much. But the important thing is, is to you to focus on this one, stochastic gradient descent, if you want to know the details about how the deep learning network actually trains, right? Because as I saying, um, saying for a long time is that this is an optimization problem. You want to find a lots of weights, right? lots of parameters that you don't know beforehand you're doing this optimization procedure to approximate to guess to get better and better parameters each iteration that gives you a better result on on the data that you are um, evaluating right okay now let's move well we're just talking about um one neuron right um, um, I, I didn't introduce the concept of neuron for, to you, but basically um, that really uh, simplified algorithm that I'm called here, uh, the linear regression, right? Let's understand this. Let's, let's kind of name this a neuron, right? So a neuron, it's an operation, let's understand this way, right? An operation that receive as an input an x that we have we have the x right what we don't have we don't have the ms right so but uh, if you're just giving a giving a shot if you're just starting the algorithm we're going to have an m right it is going to give us going to give us a, a y even a wrong y right so uh, a neuron is an operation that receive receives an x right applies an operation which is here is a multiplication right and outputs a y so the operation that we are doing here is pretty simple it's just a multiplication of single numbers right but think that we can have for example think that you can have different numbers right you can have an x one x2 x3 and for that you're going to have m1 m2 m3 that you also can learn that you also go, need to learn, right? And going to give an output that you actually know what is. But um, coming back, so from the neuron, what we are actually going to do is that we starting to building up um, this neural network. 
Okay, guys, just a second here. Okay, that now what we are going to do is that we are going to combine multiple neurons together so we can be more representative, right? Because when we add more neurons, we have the ability to better represent what is our input, right? Uh, and what we can do right now is that we not only can add more inputs, right, and have more weights here, Ws, which is the parameters that I actually want to learn. Now I just move it from Ms and B to Ws, right? You, we can do some sort of chains. We can combine these multiple operations, right? And you can think, so João Paulo, you're showing to me that what, what are the advantages here to, to add new, new, new things? Because, well, this is kind of a linear operation. This is a linear operation. Even if I have more weights here, um, this is going to give me a linear model. So linear model, linear model, linear model, linear model as an output. So basically I'm doing, for example, if I'm solving different M's and B's, M's and B's, M's and B's, I'm going to have, I could potentially represent the all this, this, uh, this multiple linear combinations into a, into a single one, right? For this reason, it's interesting when you when we are combining neurons, so when you are combining multiple operations that do this multiplication steps, that we append what we call an activation function, right? So the objective of an activation function is to introduce a non-linearity -linear inside the neural network. So you can have multiple neurons that in a baseline solve these really small problems of kind of uh, linear regression problems. We are now going to sophisticate it a little bit more. They're not going to release to me, they're not going to show to me just uh, a linear output. What is going to do is we're going to have our output from our neuron and we're now going to transform using what you call an activation function. And the main thing here is that with this, we can have um, kind of a kind of a linear algorithm that can represent nonlinear worlds, right? Nonlinear data sets, right? And this is interesting from the case, for example, there we have just two points, but now suppose you're in a universe that you have lots of different points and you want to find the boundaries that can actually match all of these points, right? With linear operations, we're not going to be able to do this. With uh, these sort of operations here, the activation functions, we are going to be able to do this. And how we can actually apply this activation function? It's a, it's a very good question. So. Um, activation function we are going to do the simple multiplication as we are doing in the past but now applying the activation function and here we just saw two different um, multiplication three different multiplication functions the linear one is basically i'm not going to do nothing it's basically the output that you saw before the the um, relu is um is one that going to to remove the zero parts of your signal and just um, reflect the positive one. And the sigmoid, which is a more soft one that can range between zero and one, depending on the, on the size of your operation, right? And so basically what you're going to do is you have your M and in your X multiplications and altered of this function, you're going to, to apply this nonlinearity, right? Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about overfitting, right? Um, this is a really, really important concept inside deep learning. I'm going to, to wrap up really soon, guys, right? So supposing that you want to find a curve that can fit uh, your trend, right? So basically, your model, your deep learn model would be, this is what we call, um, we're going to find a, a, a line here that can actually match more precisely 
the both models, right? Oh, sorry, that can match more precisely the both data sets, right? Actually, we have here, this is the same data set, right? So which one is better? Represented on the right, represented on the left. If you're talking about error measurement, you can say that, okay, the left left hand side represent better your um, represent better your input data. The right hand side, well, it's kind of fair, but it's, it's have a smaller value, right? But um, we we didn't get to this point right now. So what what happens after we train an algorithm? After we just finish your train your training, you're going to have this type of model. But remember, you just use it as an input one data set, right? But in the real world, what you're going to take is this green guy, this um, lighter green, this is your model. You're going to take this to the reality. And in the reality, when your car is moving, when your robot is moving the real world, is not going to see the same samples that it see during the training phase. It's going to see different samples and what look at what interesting thing is he is what you have suppose that in, in this uh red like in this purple dots now you have points after you finish the training you finish the training your your model is ready you're ready to put this this car to running in the real world and now you're going to be presented to lots of different conditions that you didn't saw right and this is one this is the moment that you just decided that okay now the right model is better than the first one so what we're seeing here we're seeing a, a, a phenomena that we call overfitting and overfitting is a moment that you just get your model to specialize it to the input point that you do that it didn't capture exactly what is the trend Right, so this is really, really tricky. So, and in, in the deep learning jargon, what you're saying is we are not, we do not have a good uh, generalization uh, power, right? So your model works well for the training data and works really poorly to, the, to real data, right? And, and, and disease, and this is how we actually, this is how we actually uh, um, need to control, need to divide your training data set into different portions so you can track what actually are good and are actually not good training models, right? Usually when you just to, so we can stick with the concept. So the training data is all the data set that you're using to update your weights of your models, right? The validation data is the data that you're going to use during your training, just to understand how good your model is doing, right? And when you get too much closer to your training data, you have signs of overfitting. You have signs that your model are going to learn, not, not learn, but it's going to mesmerize all the information that you have in the input, but it's not re represent the reality that can have data that is different, right? For this reason, use a validation data. That's a, that's a data, a portion of your data set that your network never going to see to update its weights, but is going to see to get metrics, right? And here in this curve, what we are seeing is, for example, this is your training um, error, the training MSAE, right? In the overfitting part, and, and, and here is uh, in, in this purple, line we have the validation training what, what what is interesting to you to see that is telling you that your validation that your model is kind of overfitting your model is kind of mesmerizing the training data is because when you during your training you have a particular moment to do that you do it periodically 
using some uh, closed closed moments in, into your training pipeline, you just decide, okay, after 10 bats, after 20 bats of processing, I'm going to do a validation procedure just to understand what is the results into this the uh, into a data set that is not going is not being used during training, right? And that's it. So when you your validation error diverts from the the training error is the moment that you just decide to stop, right? So overfitting is a problem. So avoid memorization is uh, is kind of key in during deep learning, right? And but let's move it really quick into into the other. Um, oh, okay. So let's see what we have right now. Okay, so it's going to be really specific, right? Um, so guys, um, so the final final remarks here for this presentation. So um, we had. We we had two. Uh, so Juan just raised uh, his hands. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, I would like to ask something. Um, in the like, I think that is called like the same the same gradient algorithm or something like that. Like the the mm -hmm. one that is with loss. Mm, what happened if if for example there are like a local minimum? Do you know like the, I don't know. Yeah, you know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is a with that? really perfect, uh, good question. So the thing is, we are working with a non-convex optimization problem. So there is no guarantee of mean of global minima. So there are things that you can do to avoid this type of thing, right? Uh, the um, the optimization algorithm itself has some internal mechanism to avoid this, right? But the fact is, how we know that the value that we got is not a local minima. You're never going to know. What you need to do is you need to find a result that is kind of suitable, that actually solves your problem. Right. So what you're going to need to do is not only a single training is going to be enough for you. You're going to need to do lots of different trainings so you can then, in this hypothesis space, you can get the model that gets to you the lower results, right? So, and how I, what I can do to actually differentiate, to actually generate, because if there is no uh, random variables inside my optimization procedure, right? How can I get different results in different trainings, right? So for this reason, um, Deep learning introduce lots of different mechanisms so you can have different results in different training procedures. For example, the order that you read your data set. If you read your data set in a particular order, you can just, for a second training, mix things up, right? This is going to give you a different, a different output. Why? Because when you just start to compute in your gradient, probably is going to give you a different direction because you're just starting reading a different portion of your data. Do you got it? So this is kind of key. Uh, the algorithm is going to output different results over different uh, conditions, right? So the reading your data in different orders is just one thing that you can do. Other thing that you can do, add more data. Try to work with different parameters like this, right? For example, if maybe your gradient is too long, Maybe you can work with um, a, a, learn, a small learning height, which is going to escalate the size of a gradient each step, right? So this is what we call hyperparameters of the network. So a parameter is actually a learned parameter that's going to be used in the final model. A hyperparameter is an algorithm parameter, right? It's not a model parameter. An algorithm parameter, for example, is the learning height. So how, how big i'm going to escalate my gradient each each algorithm step right so when you run different different runs of training with different learning heights with different number of epochs which is one you finish one epoch when you just finish to read your entire data set and you can do a, a double reading of your data set there's no problem with that 
So it's kind of usual, actually. So you have thousands, sometimes thousands of epochs to find a different, um, to, to, to train an algorithm, right? So you can choose what is, what, what is the good number, number of epochs. So vary your data, try to ver vary your model architecture, for instance. I didn't got it at this point, unfortunately, but try to get this, this, um, um, different insights of your algorithm. You can change your optimization algorithm, right? So I'm, I'm talking about I'm, I'm, uh, SGG, SG, uh, stochastic gradient descent is the most important one because it is the basics. The other three ones that we have here are kind of derivates from these. If you understand these ones, you do not necessarily need to understand this. Right in the details, in the minor details, right? Is would be interesting, but it's not necessary. Um, you can, for example, then also try to change your optimizers, right? So this hyperparameter search with different data, different parameters of, of your algorithm are going to generate different minimas for your data. Then into the this uh, hypothesis space that you just generate generated, you pick the one that delivers to you the lowest error into the validation set. Remembering that the validation set is the set that are not used to update the parameters of your model, right? Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so guys, um, I, I want to say thank you for your time for, for this really, really, really sh short course on deep learning to talk a little bit about, about um, the fundamentals of deep learning. Um, I don't want to disencourage you to keep studying the field. This is totally the opposite. I really say sorry if some of the, 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 the concepts here was not totally clear to you. There's no problem on that because it's very difficult to capture in the first glance, right? It's really difficult. What I'm going to do to you is I'm going to send you um, these slides, the slides that I didn't present, so we can take a look, right? I'm going to send to you some practical exercises so we can take a look and do it by yourself. So are basically Jupyter notebooks that you can just run in your local machine and execute step by step. Right, and send you at least one or two uh, good deep learning courses that you can take a look to to keep your your studies right. But I really recommend you to to keep working to keep um, getting more more knowledge on the on the on the field because it's going to be important for you somehow in the future because it's combines a little bit of statistics, a little bit of optimizations. So um, supposing that you're all scientists here working in a in a in a science related related field so uh math programming statistics is important for any any time of your journey during your career career right thank you very much joel well i have a, a, a last question sorry <laughs> okay uh, no problem in the in, in this in this the same like the 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 descent um graph or something like that we see like only like uh, two two dimensions, yes? yes. But there are there are like more dimensions. Then it depends on, on the problem. Exactly. When when we we use a very simplified representation there, if you saw what we call the loss curve, was just a bidimensional that represent the weights, right? M and B. For deep learning, each neuron that we we have we have in, in our layers we're going to have a parameter. So our search space, it's a really high dimensional space. So it's not possible for us to see, right? We, we, we just, our brains just can't capture this type of information. We just can't plot this one. So the, the behind the scenes, the optimization problem in terms of the numerical part is kind of really complex, right? But the good part is that the, the the multidimensional calculus is basically the same for 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 not not the same of course but but when you plug more variables the method do not change brutally right um and just for you it's it's the these slides that we have here are kind of interest so, so you can understand of course it's going to to be 
with uh, the slide presentation, but it show uh, how the algorithm, the math behind the algorithm actually works, right? The gradient descent, right? The gradient descent algorithm. We have a target function, right? Which you, we call a loss function. And basically the gradient that we want to find is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, given by the derivative of this function. Right, and, and here we have some some really um, uh, really simple examples, so you can actually match. So, for example, we have b's, we have m's, and we have the intensity, we have the size of this vector. If you go step by step here, you're going to see it, that it makes a lot of sense, and you're starting to see that what are remember the learning height with, that we call the, the the lambda here, what the effect on the gradient size. Now we can see visually what's the difference, right? And if you use um, a, a small gradients, you have more, because if you're going to use gradients of the size, you're going to go there, then you're going to go there, 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 and go to, you know, walking around circles in, into the, um, around the, the, the target direction, right? But when you just do this, this, uh, this scaling, which is called apply the learning the learning, um, the learning hate to your gradient. You're going to see that, and and there you can see the math in a really simplified way. For sure, it's just a bi-dimensional problem, but you're going to see that it's just basic basic calculus, right? So this is the beauty of deep learning because um, it's very so powerful, so powerful, but the structure, the math behind, is so simple, right? That you can explain to you to a gradient student, undergraduate student that have, you know, uh, the second calculus discipline, a red token with multidimensional calculus that no derivatives, partial derivatives and integrals. If you learn these, you're able to learn deep learning, the details of the algorithm itself, right? So I really encourage you, if you want to, to uh, get more in depth about deep learning and artificial intelligence to understand the fundamentals. This is fundamental, understand the algorithm called Stochastic gradient descent and the back propagation is fundamental. After that, you just you know use the implementations. You're not going to implement this by yourself. TensorFlow is going to do that for you. PyTorch is going to do that for you. MXNet is going to do that for you, right? Um, so this is my, my my hint. Just learn the basics, learn because it's going to give you all always going to give you some different insights from what you need to do differently to so you can get to the results, right? Thank you. Okay, guys, any other question? Well, I think if there's if there's no more questions, we can finish the meeting. Yes, perfect. So, so guys, Thank you very much for, for your time. I really appreciate the invitation. I hope you just learned something new today. I'm going to share with you all the content that I promised. And see you next time. OK, well, see you. Uh, well, uh, one final uh, thing that I wanted to, to, to say to you that is